Thank you so much for everyone joining us today. And thank you to everyone on live stream. Thank you. We really appreciate you watching us today. So the title of my message today is a continuation of my ongoing series called The Road to Calvary. This series is very important for us to study. We are studying... Today we're going to be going ahead and sitting on the different appearances Jesus, with the different times Jesus appeared to his followers. For those who believed in Jesus Christ, the different times he met with the people after he had risen from the dead. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, this is the last portion of Matthew. And I'm going to go ahead and show the next PowerPoint slide now. So far, we've discussed all of these things, beginning with the first, the last week of Jesus' life, on that road to Calvary, and then how Jesus was entombed for three days, and how he rose from the dead, and he's seated at the right hand of God. So we've studied all of these things that took place, and our final message in the series, Road to Calvary, I will preach on today. It's about Jesus' appearances. Each one of these appearances is very, very critical. The first thing we talked about was how Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey. People shouted, Hosanna to the King, Son of David, Hosanna! And they flocked to see him. So after Jesus entered into the temple, after riding on this donkey, he saw what was going on in the filth and the sin and the money changing that was taking place where people were getting unruly prophets. And so he kicked out and he cleared up the temple. He prepared the temple for the Passover. There was a tree that Jesus passed by, and this tree had no fruit on it, a fig tree. This tree had no fruit, and so Jesus cursed this fig tree. And we talked about that and how it was related to the Israelites, how they had no spiritual fruit, and so God was cursing them in the sense that he was cursing this fig tree. Then we talked about how Wednesday Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples. And as we're celebrating today, Jesus said, This is the new covenant of my blood that is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. In the morning, early in the morning, he was captured, and by Thursday he was crucified on the cross. And the soldiers testified that Jesus was truly the Son of God. And as the sun is setting, right before the sun sets, they bury him. And he is in tune for three days and three nights. And on Sunday morning, very early, Jesus Christ rises from the dead to life. He lives again. Wow. An angel comes and rolls away the stone. His body is no longer in there. And people come and look and his body is gone. And the angel says, he is not here, but he has risen. Go and tell his disciples. And so the women flock and they inform the disciples. And that begins the people who are sharing that Jesus Christ has risen. And so now we're going to go ahead today and we're going to discuss the different appearances that Jesus appeared to his disciples and followers. Different people who believed him and how he allowed them to touch him and proved his existence. And he did this for 40 days. Jesus Christ appeared over and over again to people, to the Lord, to different areas, for 40 days. And then he, let the, he met the disciples for the final time, and he said goodbye, and he ascended into heaven. And 10 days later, God poured out the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit descended on the Feast of Pentecost, and power uh, was spread, all because of Jesus Christ. And as I've been doing throughout this entire time, I'm relating this back to the seven feasts of the Old Testament. The feast of the first fruits is when Jesus rose from the dead, and then there's 50 days in between them, and the feast of Pentecost takes place 50 days after the feast of first fruits. And Jesus walked around on the earth for 40 days, and when there was 10 days left before the feast of Pentecost, there was about 120 people and the disciples. And they were all gathered together, and then God poured out the Holy Spirit on them. And they received 
the power in Acts chapter 2 explains this in depth. So Jesus Christ has completely filled the spring feasts, but we are looking forward to the fall feasts. The Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of the Tabernacle. And right now, it's called the Church's Age, the Church Age of Summer Harvest. The good news is being shared. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was crucified, he was buried, he rose from the dead. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And we're declaring the Gospel, the good news now, for over 2,000 years. Why? We are looking forward, we are anticipating when the trumpet will sound and we will meet Jesus Christ in the air. That is the day that we as Christians are looking forward to. And then go ahead and go back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 10. The angel informed the women, Jesus is not here, but has risen. Go and tell his disciples. And so they ran in and told. But then, as they were going back and saw Jesus, they met Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go. Go, take my word to my brethren and tell them to leave for Galilee. He wanted them to go to the north, to Galilee. He said, and there I will meet them. Tell them that is where I will go. And Jesus would be there. And the women must have been thinking, is this for you? Because it was so powerful. And remember there had been a huge earthquake at that time. And then to see this, and then to see Jesus appear to all of these different people. To go to all of these different places. Ten different places. I'm going to go ahead and discuss the ten different appearances the scripture talks about on the future slides and on my message this morning. The first appearance was to Mary Magdalene. This is the first person that Jesus appeared to. Other times, people say a group, all the texts agree that there was women who were crying and heartbroken and sorrowful. In John chapter 20, there's a more expansion on it, but I'm going to go ahead and focus on Mark chapter 16, 9. Mark chapter 16, 9 through 20. It wasn't always found in certain uh, manuscripts. In NIV, in different manuscripts, they don't always have um, these verses in Mark. Certain translations don't uh, include that. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared at the first to Mary Magdalene. She was the first person that Jesus appeared to, Mary Magdalene. She was before a terrible sinner, but God completely changed her life. She was the one who poured the oil on the feet of Jesus. And Mark says that Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons. Mary Magdalene was a woman who struggled with demons inside of her. Jesus cast them out. There was great spiritual conflict in her life. And Jesus removed those demons from her. Yeah. And she followed and loved Jesus Christ. So when she saw that Jesus' body was not in the tomb, she was distraught and began to cry. But Jesus came and met her first and comforted her. She was the first person that Jesus appeared to, Mary Magdalene. She fell at, her, at his feet and worshipped him. She clung to him. And he said, don't take hold of me yet. I have not yet ascended to my father. 
She wanted to cling to him. She didn't want to let go of him. You know, like kids, how they grab hold of your feet and they're like holding on, they're clutching you, clinging to you, you're trying to walk, and there's like this great heavy weight on you. It's kind of like that. She was kind of like that. She clung to Jesus. She loved him greatly. We should do. We should be like Mary Magdalene. We should love him greatly. And we're going to take a look at the second people that Jesus appeared to. The second appearance was to a group of several women. And last week we discussed this in Matthew chapter 28 9. As they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. So they came to him and held him by the feet and worshipped him. They fall down before him. They give him the honor and the glory and they worship Jesus Christ as he's standing there. These women were the first. So now, we're going to take a look at the third appearance. Now, the third appearance was to Simon Peter. So when you compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have all these Gospels, so you have to kind of like figure out, okay, which happened first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then try to see how it fits together. Luke 24, verse 34. The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon Peter. The fourth appearance was the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus came up and talked with them. They're there walking and talking and they're telling the story of what's happened. Jesus was crucified. He's been buried. And some people are saying the body was stolen and were wondering about that. So Jesus listens to them. He just takes it all in. And it says in Mark chapter 16, 12, after that he appeared in another form. This is kind of different. So Jesus Christ, his form was different. He was able to change as it were. So he had a glorified body, but he like, didn't allow them to see that. He appeared to two of them as they walked in the country and they talked with him. And so Jesus goes back and takes the Old Testament and he tells how he fulfills the law and the prophets. He's like, they're all pointing to Jesus Christ's crucifixion, his resurrection, the Psalms, they're all pointing to Jesus Christ. And he expounds to them the law and the prophets and how they all point to Jesus Christ. And so they're approaching their city and they're, they're, they're getting ready to take leave. And they realize, wow, this is such a skilled teacher, how he communicates. And he's about to take his leave of them and he goes in with them to a house. And they're things set up, food and, and, and the such. And Jesus opens their eyes and they can see who Jesus is. <gasps> you, Jesus! We've been talking with you for hours as we've as we walked to the city, but you are He. We wondered who it was that when we talked to you and our hearts burned within us. Wow! His teaching was so great and they realized, oh, it was Jesus. He opened their eyes and they recognized Him. And he explained that the Old Testament was completely just a fulfillment of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus disappeared. And so those two disciples were filled with joy. And they informed the other disciples that we saw the risen Jesus. We saw him. We talked with him. The fifth appearance was to the apostles and other disciples. Luke chapter 24, 36. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be to you.
The disciples were filled with fear. They thought that Jesus' body had been stolen. And they were in the upper room with the doors locked. And they were very frightened that maybe they were going to be taken or captured. And Jesus just appears in the room. And the disciples are stunned to see Jesus Christ. Here he is. The doors are all locked. Everything is barred. And here he appears and says, Peace be unto you. Come, feel me. And the disciples look at him in shock. And he takes a bread and he eats and he drinks. And he's like, I have a body just like you. I'm a human being just like you. And they are stunned as they see Jesus Christ there. There are many different times in which Jesus Christ comes through the walls and leaves through the walls. He has great power in his glorified body. We'll go ahead and take a look at the sixth appearance. John, chapter 20, verse 27. And then he said to Thomas, because Thomas had not yet seen him. And they said, Thomas, Jesus appeared, he ate with us. And Thomas was like, I cannot believe it. It's impossible. It cannot be. He is dead. That's when life ends. You must be making this up. It can't be true, Thomas says. And so Thomas is a skeptic, and he doesn't believe that it's possible that Jesus has risen from the dead. The other disciples are sharing it with him. They're like, you've seen him. And Thomas refuses to believe the story. But one day, Thomas is there with the twelve, and Jesus appears again. Thomas sees Jesus Christ there. In John chapter 20, verse 27, and he said to Thomas, Thomas, come on, reach your finger here. Touch me. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put your hand into my side. So Thomas goes and he feels Jesus has flesh. He has a body. He's not a ghost that is untouchable and ungrabbable. He has the nails, the piercings, and his wrists, and, and Thomas touches and feels it. And Jesus says, feel your hand into my side, like a soldier, and pierce me. And Jesus was on the cross. Blood and water poured out from his side. And Thomas feels it. And so Jesus says to him, Do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas fell down at the feet of Jesus and said, My Lord and my God. He calls Jesus his God. He calls Jesus God. He doesn't doubt, but he recognizes that Jesus Christ is God. It's the end of that discussion. We are not to be doubting. Jesus Christ is God. He's Lord. He is God. The seventh appearance in Mark. Well, in Matthew, they, we're going to put that aside for just a moment. But we're going to look at a different perspective from Mark. And it said, and Jesus said to him, said to them, Go out into the world. Go out into the world and announce the good news to the people. Tell the gospel to the people. Spread the people. Spread the gospel out to the people. Go. Go and tell them. The eighth appearance, when Jesus appeared at the sea, at the, in the north, in the Sea of Galilee, it says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples of the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, Jesus showed himself. Now Peter and the other apostles, they had seen him. He had appeared to them. And then he had left. And they 
were feeling sad, they were feeling depressed. Peter was depressed, because remember, Peter had denied Jesus three times. You know, when he had first met the woman, and she had met him and they had been talking, and he was taken aback, and he had this thought in the back of his mind, about how he had denied Jesus. And then when he saw him, imagine how he must have held back feeling guilty. He had no peace in his heart. Thinking, what would I tell him? I denied him three times. And then to be with the group, and they go up to the north, to the north, and they were fishing all through the night. And remember, they had not even caught one fish. And then Jesus came to them, and he called to them. How are you doing out there? How's the fishing going? And Peter answered back, they're not getting anything. Nothing. And Jesus said, throw your net on the other side of the boat. So they did. And there were thousands and thousands of fish caught in the net. So much so that the boat started to tip and to go down. And when Peter looked, he knew. He knew that that was Jesus. So he took off his clothes and he jumped in the water and he started swimming towards Jesus. And then Jesus, already, when he arrived, Jesus already had fish cooking for them. And he sat down with them and Peter was in Jesus' presence. And the other disciples out there you know, they were still tending to the business of bringing in all of those fish on the boat. But Peter was talking to Jesus by himself, face to face with Jesus. And Jesus said to him, do you love me? Do you love me more than the others, Peter? And Peter said, yes, Lord. And then a second time, Jesus asked him, do you love me? And Peter said, yes. And on the third time, Peter's heart was so broken with him because he knew. And he knew that Jesus knew. Jesus knew that he loved him. And then Jesus said to him, Then feed my sheep. You know, all the depression and the sorrow that Peter had been feeling changed to his strength. Because you know how sometimes when you're a teacher and you know, you've got students that you know, always have their hands going up and have always got questions going up all the time, over and over again. You must feel kind of like, enough now, okay, you don't start having any questions. I'm done. Stop, 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 stop. Well, thinking, thinking about that, you know, and, and wishing that they would, you know, maybe be quiet, and that student just keeps asking the question, you know. So it must have been the same way with Peter and with Jesus. And then at that time, remember, when he denied Jesus, and Jesus had told him, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. And Peter said, no, I'll never do that. I would never, but he had. When Jesus was taken to the courts, and Peter went with him. When he was taken to the home of the governor, remember how he cursed the people that, that said he was with Jesus. And then when Jesus passed by him and he looked at him, and then he saw Jesus, Jesus' body beaten, and then when he saw Jesus pass by him at the last, seeing his eyes again and changed him to new life when he saw Jesus. And then from then on, Peter would know, Peter would spread the gospel after. So this eighth appearance of the Sea of Galilee, there is there is much discussion about that. The ninth appearance. So remember. He appeared to the one woman, and then to the other woman, and then to Peter, and then to the apostles, and then to Thomas. That wasn't all. It was not the old, only people. It has been put down that he appeared to more than 500 people. 500 people. More than 500. They saw him. They saw Jesus. And all of those people that had seen him in all of those different places and witnessed him were more than 500 people that could look upon him. 
you know, his three years of ministry that he had before on the earth. You know, we're talking about the time, you know, from the resurrection to a specific period of time. 500, more than 500 people saw the Christ. Met him as a person and knew. The witness, now you know in a court you need three or more, three or more witnesses, right? Because you have to have the appropriate amount of proof in, in court. They say, did you see this? Did you see the body? And the people, you know, say, oh yes, no, you're telling the truth. And then, the, now, over 500 people who come through and tell the stories of how they had seen him. Lines and lines of people, hordes of people had seen him. Proving that it is not a myth, that Jesus did die, that Jesus did rise back to life again. Only one who could do so. And then the last appearance was when Jesus ascended into heaven. So it says in Mark 16, 19, it says, So then after the Lord had spoken with them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So these stories of these appearances are very important. Because it didn't just end with the resurrection. The story continued on. Now the Jewish leaders and the soldiers who never they had been in agreement. They decided that the story would be that the body had been stolen. And so when they went out to the people to say this, to tell this, to confuse the people, all of these people kept saying, no, I see him. I ate with him. We spoke. We talked to him for 40 days. All of these stories went on, all of this time. The road to Calvary, and how long was that? It was one week. The stories about that, and still the stories about that group. And then Jesus was with the people for 40 days. It was put down. Precisely. You can learn about this. It has been taught. It wasn't... <coughs> It wasn't noted, but it was more information. And then at the last in Matthew 28, 16 to 17, you know, this, the chapter goes down to 20. It's a, it's a big chapter. And it's very significant, significant teachings. And here it says that the disciples met the King Jesus in Galilee. Verse 16 to 17. So we see as we read this, it says the eleven disciples, they went away into Galilee, to the mountain, which Jesus had appointed for them. So it's interesting that Jesus, it says he had appointed for them, and that meant that before, before Jesus had been crucified, he told them that he would be, he told them that he would die, and then he said that he would resurrect and that he would meet them in Galilee. But, you know, the disciples, the twelve and then the eleven, you know, he was telling them, remember this, remember this, I will be crucified, but I will rise. And I will go to Galilee and I will meet with you again. I will meet with you at that place, that specific area. Which is where he taught them during all that time, where he did his ministry, where he was in the boat with them, where he fished for them. When he taught in the temple, in the synagogue, often, for those three years he was with them. But most of his time was spent in that area. Now Jerusalem, they had to go to Jerusalem for the feasts, for the feast of Passover, and they would go there for Pentecost. They would go there for Passover to celebrate that. But most of the time Jesus would remain in the area of Galilee for those three years. He would go around to areas around it, but that was Jesus' home. 
He had been there for many years. He had grown up in Nazareth, in the city of Nazareth, growing up all that time as a boy, until he was around 30 and then he left to do his ministry. He was led to do his ministry to be with the people. Now he did go back to Nazareth to preach, but the people denied him. They threw him out, they rejected him. Jesus was thinking, this is the home where I grew up, you know me. But he couldn't stay there, he couldn't go to his town. He had to go to the different area, the area of Galilee. So that's where he was for three years. So we know that Jesus said to him, go there, go to this place, and there I will meet you. So in 17 it says, they went to this place, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Now remember, the 11, they went together, they met with Jesus, but yet a few doubted him. You know, others believed firmly right away. They said, no, this is Jesus. And others doubted. it. So we know that Thomas doubted. He said, unless I can touch him, unless I can see the wounds on his body and touch him, I will not know that he is God. But, and when he did, he saw him and he saw Jesus. But he believed that he was his Lord and his God. Now in John 20 it says, Blessed are those people, those people who believe me, but have never seen me. People who had never met him. Now have any of you ever met Jesus? I mean, to have Jesus really come to you, None of us in our lifetime have. You know, some say that preacher, has he ever met Jesus? No, he hasn't. No? Physically, no? Jesus appeared to me, no. His word is there. But still, I believe. I believe in Jesus. But so many more people deny him. Jesus said, you are more blessed than those who have seen me. And who are believing. So many people are like that now. They say unless they can meet him or see him, then they cannot believe in him. So those of Je who there were those in the group that saw Jesus and believed in him immediately. They fell down and they worshipped him. They gave him honor. They fell down on their faces. They praised him. They gave him glory. They thanked him. And that is what he's meant by worship. All of these things. And Jesus appeared to them. Now they're in Matthew chapter 4 when we talk about the devil tempted Jesus for 40 days. Jesus, remember, had been fasting and he had nothing to eat. And the devil went to him. He went to him three times. He was a very famous thing. And he said to him, the first time, he said to him, If you will bow down to me, then I will give you everything here. I will give you dominion over everything. And Jesus said, Get thee away from me, son, because there is only one God. And we bow down to one God alone. But it's odd now that some of these disciples just bowed right down to Jesus. One God, remember, and they bowed down to Jesus because they knew who he was. They knew that he was God. It was clear to them that he was. God, that he was with God. 
In Hebrews it says, All the angels in the heaven bow down and worship Jesus. Angels. Angels in heaven bow down and worship Jesus. In Philippians, in chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Everyone of every voice and every language will say that he is Lord. Every knee will bow to the name of Jesus Christ in heaven and on earth and under the earth. All will turn to Jesus. And imagine that the devil said to Jesus, kneel down before me and I will give you everything. Jesus, who's on the throne, and all the angels, and even remember, and even the devil will bow to Jesus all over because he is the only one. So when it says here they worshiped him, the sadly, still, there are still many that die. Even today, people still die. If you t say to someone, do you know about Jesus? No, mommy, they don't want to. They would refuse to bow to him, to worship him. They deny him. Every day, you see him. They would say, he's just an old man, I'm not going to worship him. And that's a huge problem in this world because all would turn to Jesus. And this gives glory to the Father. The only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. He is the image of the Father. There is no other image of Him. Because God Himself, God the Father Himself is a Spirit. And so to get through to Him, we go through Jesus. So it says here, when they saw Him, they worshipped. In Matthew chapter 28, 18, we're going to take a look at the next important thing. Jesus Christ himself assures his followers of his power. Jesus came and he spoke to them saying, All authority. All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to me. And I give that to you, my disciples. Rather, John says that God the Father gave the judgment and the authority to the Son. All things in heaven. The stars. It's not talking about that. It's calling, it's talking about where the angels dwell, in the presence of God. Everything has been given to Jesus Christ. He has the authority as the Son of God. And on earth. Jesus Christ himself alone has the authority. It's all been given to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has the right to rule and reign with power. So Jesus Christ was in the bosom of the Father. He came and he was born of the Virgin Mary. He grew up. He was a humble man. He became flesh. God became flesh. John talks about this. It says, The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. So Jesus Christ, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, talks about this. It says that Jesus Christ is the image of the Father who has come down 
And it, he died not equal to be, he died not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a servant. He humbled himself. He came to this earth. He became exactly like a man. He humbled himself from Godhood. He was willing to humble himself to the death, even the death on the cross. So here, Jesus Christ, he comes to the earth, and on earth, and oftentimes there's some debate and discussion. If Jesus was God while he was on earth. And some people say they never see Jesus Christ say, I am God. They say that he never claimed that. And some people argue that it doesn't appear in the New Testament. Jesus self declared. Jesus Christ did not declare himself in the New Testament God because he had two natures. One is he was deity. He was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. He was God indwelled in flesh. And he humbled himself. And so as a human being, he was also limited. Jesus Christ was hungry. Jesus Christ became tired. He cried. Jesus Christ was angry. He had a nature and a personality just like us. He was fully human, but he was also humble in everything he did. He said, I am. And so there's one story I want to point out where someone asked Jesus, his follow oh, Jesus asked his followers, who do men say that I am? And so they said, well, some people say that you are Elijah. Some people say that you are John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Some people say that you are a prophet. And Jesus said, okay, hold on a minute. Who do you say I am? You've been with me for three years. Who do you say that I am? So Peter answers, you are the son of the living God. Wait a minute. The son of the living God. In the Aramaic language, the idea of living God means the one and only, means he alone is God. The Son means he's also human and he's also the living God in one. So Peter declares that and Jesus says, that you didn't know that, but God the Father had to open your eyes so that you could know that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, that He is both fully God and fully human. In John chapter 5, the Jewish leaders are turning against Jesus Christ. They're plotting to kill Him. And they're very angry at Jesus Christ. And they said, He made Himself to be equal with God. And that's why they wanted to kill Him. They were actually in the process of picking up stones to kill Him. And Jesus escaped from them. He said, the, the, the religious leader said, you're making yourself equal with God. And they were very angry at this. And in John, in another place, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jewish religious leaders were furious at Jesus. And they picked up stones. They wanted to stone him. And Jesus departed from them. Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God. He's also the Son of Man. Jesus Christ, yes, does declare himself many times the Son of God throughout the Bible. And we need to discuss with those who are skeptics, those who do not believe Jesus Christ could be God. We need to, as Christians, believe that he is the Son of God. And we need to have no question in our mind. First John chapter 1 is the proof of this. The Word was God. In John chapter 1, verse 18, I love the translation of Nasby where it says, No one can see God at any time except the begotten Son. And NSB says, something slightly different.
John started in the New Testament they found a second copy not written by John but copied by him and this translation that they found it says begotten of God And then in English it says begotten son. And so there's some discussion about the translation of this word. And you look back at the Greek, but it very, very strongly tells us this Greek word. And it once again it verifies that Jesus is God and the deity of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 118, it says, No one has ever seen God at any time except the begotten Son, who is in the bosom. It's this idea of fear on the chest. The bosom of the Father. It means God the Father is here and Jesus Christ is here. It's this idea of being in the bosom of the, of the Father in close relationship. And the Father has declared himself through the Son. This is very critical for us Christians to understand that all authority is given to Jesus Christ. And he is the one who rules and reigns and has the authority. Additionally, there are some commands that Jesus commissions his followers to do. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, all of us, we have a responsibility to obey Jesus Christ. We are not to obey our own desires. You're not to obey a pastor because there would be false teaching and false pastors. But the one who we obey is Jesus Christ. We are to follow him. He is the one who has the preeminence above all. We are to learn from Him. And when people see us, they should see Christ. And when you see a pastor, you should be studying God's Word. And you're not just to just take it in without considering things. But you're just go home. You're to get out your Bible. You're to look into it. Did that pastor say things that are in concordance with Scripture? Did it match? Did it follow the Word of God? And this is very critical for every person here today to do. And I encourage you to do this and to study God's word for yourself. This is a very, very famous verse that we hear over and over again. Missionaries use it, evangelists use it. People use it when they share the gospel. And when they encourage that. But I'm going to go into this a little more in depth today. Jesus said, Go. Means don't sit back and, and stay in the same place. So don't, don't be passive. Go. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. It's this idea of being passive. Even perhaps you meet a friend and you're, you're chatting with them on Skype or something. Maybe you're like, I want to share the good news with them, but I don't know how. You feel like it's not the right time. I'm unsure about this. You know, you talk about cooking, sports, fishing, sewing, hobbies, all these different things, the latest gossip, what's going on on Facebook. But it's important that as Christians, we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we plant those seeds of the gospel, of the good news. 38, 39 years, I've been a Christian. Sometimes there are struggles in being disciplined. Sometimes when I come together with people to plant seeds, how can I do that? If the gospel would come to fruition. Sometimes there are people that I never see again. So they may die before I ever get a chance to interact with them. And so it's very important, I know for myself, to share the gospel. It says, and make disciples. People often don't like to hear people preaching at them in their face. You know the sign we have in ASL, oh, they're all in my face preaching at me all the time. I'm sick of hearing it. But this says, go and make disciples. What does this mean? This means that we need to go and we need to share. Christians are going to go and share. It's not my responsibility to change people, but it's our responsibility to go. On Paul's missionary journeys, he, 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 it's all described in the book of Acts.
Paul, God just gave him opportunity after opportunity to share and share and share. And you read Acts to see how God gives opportunity after opportunity to share. And it's all pointing to Jesus Christ, all for the glory of Jesus Christ. And as Christians, sometimes people are not growing with the Lord. There's not a lot of maturity. Maybe you're still a baby in Christ. And God still wants you to make disciples. You're not just going to like, oh, I'm just going to give you a seed and I'm going to take off. Oh, forget about it. No. You're going to share, you're going to come together, you're going to sit down, you're going to explain in depth. You're going to expand for this person who Jesus Christ is. He's going to be teaching this thing on, mentoring, encouragement, support. It's a process. Like when a baby just gets born, when there's a newborn baby, you give the baby milk, and then you just leave it. Oh, it's going to feed itself, and it's a newborn baby, right? No, the baby's going to scream and cry. It can't feed itself. It can't stick a bottle in its mouth. Like a small baby, you know, three, four months old, it can't unscrew the lid and take a drink of water like I can. The baby can't do that. Another person has to feed and nourish that newborn babe and help and spoon feed and teach and all these processes. They have to go slowly through the process for months and months and months and months and months. It requires a lot of effort and a lot of work on the part of the parents and caregivers. And in the same way, we usually do the same thing as followers of Jesus when we make disciples. But oftentimes, People just preach the gospel and they're like, oh, it's not my responsibility anymore. I'm just going to leave it to them. And then the Christian, the newborn baby Christian is having issues and they're falling into sin and they're going back into the world. They're having all these struggles and weakness and they give up on Christianity. But it is our responsibility as followers of Christ to mentor, to grow, to disciple other believers until they are ready to be strong and stand on their own. And that's what Paul did in his missionary journey. He set up churches and he mentored, he tutored, he planted, he still was involved in their life. He still was involved and nourished them. He said, do this in all nations. Make disciples in all nations. And this was a stunning, stunning fact because the Jewish people at this time thought that only the Jews were going to be saved. It's just for us. But Gentiles, non-Jews, Jesus said, make disciples of all nations. The Gentiles. All nations will, will have people. And then it says to baptize them in the name. And the Greek word for name is singular. That's why it's not names, because God is not many, God is one. The name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Because God is three in one. This is a really controversial, dis you know, there's been a lot of vlogs. Um, um, I'm not going to go into it this morning, but there's been a lot of controversial vlogs that have been out on Facebook recently talking about this topic. And so, baptizing people in the name of the Father. So some people think that we are only to talk about Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ points to the Father. He always gives glory to the Father. We see that, how it's the Father, He's always first, the Son is second, and third is the Holy Spirit. All these represented in Scripture. The, Bob, the, the Old Testament starts out by revealing the Father, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it's all about God the Father. And in the New Testament, we see the Son, Jesus Christ. And then after Jesus goes and ascends into heaven, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is this hierarchy. And we see that. Sometimes people are like, oh, they neglect the Old Testament. And 
And we see the Holy Spirit and how they, they have different functions and different roles that they do in the life of the believer. So we have the character of God the Father. How do we study God the Father? And there are some churches that emphasize just the Father, just the Son, or just the Holy Spirit. And they tend to magnify one and lessen the others. Sometimes there's this imbalance. They are all equal, though. They are all equally God. And Jesus Christ emphasizes, my Father, my Father. He talks about this over and over and over again. All glory and honor to the Father. In the Lord's Prayer, how does it start out? Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father. We're going to take a look at the next, next verse here. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. We are to teach people to observe all things that Jesus commanded. Some people I interact with, they ask me, which should I start reading? The Old Testament or the New Testament? Or which book should I start reading? And some people say, I prefer John. Or I prefer the Gospels. There's all these different preferences. But this verse says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. In Matthew, It talks about how Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And now Jesus says, Lo, I am with you always. Jesus makes this promise to all of his followers. Even unto the end of the age, Lo, I am with you always. In the King James it says, I am with you to the end of the world. Age means I'm with you in the different time periods all throughout history. And so here we are, over 2,000 years later, things have changed, we have different nations in charge, but God is the same. Jesus Christ is always with his followers, even unto the end of the age. It means that's until Jesus comes back and there is a completion of everything that God is doing. And this is a promise that God makes to us. And this is the authority that Jesus has that enables him to make this command. And he sends, and he sends and he encourages people to go out and do the good news, to make followers, to make disciples, all these things. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even to the end of the age. God never leaves us or forsakes us. He is always with us. So I'm going to go ahead and conclude with a couple different things. And we're going to take a look in Luke real quick here as my closing point. Thanks. You remember that there were two men on the road and Jesus came and, and talked to them for hours and their hearts burned within them and then he opened their eyes and then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things might be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. In the Old Testament, the prophets and the Psalms, they were all pointing to Jesus Christ. Everything the sum total of the entire Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then we look at this first here. There were many prophets. 
Elijah, Joshua, Ezekiel, many, many prophets. They were all pointing to Jesus Christ. And the Psalms, in addition, they point to Jesus Christ. And he said to them, these things were all about me. So now Jesus says to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. In the Old Testament, we see all these things. They're offering sacrifices. They're offering sacrifices. Abraham offers sacrifice. There's all these sacrifices that are required, but they were all pointing back to Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. That Jesus would rise from the dead on the third day. So the Old Testament had all these things, and they were referencing and foretelling Jesus Christ. So this Road to Calvary series ends with the ascension of Jesus Christ. And the point of this Road to Calvary series is Jesus Christ's Road to Calvary. And we consider how God the Father, how Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. And how when we see Jesus Christ, we see the Father in Revelation, it says, the Lamb of God is seated on the throne. Behold the Lamb of God seated on the throne. The Greek word for throne is singular. There's one. So sometimes we see this idea and we imagine two people sitting next to one another. That's not how it is. This idea of right hand means that the position of authority and power in Revelation chapter 4, John writes this, and he says he saw glory. In Revelation 5, it explains what it looks like in heaven. And it talks about who is worthy to open the seals. And John says, a lamb. He's standing in the midst of the throne. He's the lamb of God. All the angels that all bow down to him and worship him. And in the last chapter of Revelation 22, it says he was enthroned forever and ever. So people ask us, will we ever see God the Father in person? And I say no. And other people say yes. And I say no, it's impossible to see God the Father because he has no physical body. The Father is a spirit. He cannot be seen. But we will see Jesus Christ. We will see his body. And by seeing Jesus Christ, we see God, we see the Father as it were. And we will fall down on our knees and worship and give glory to Jesus Christ. Give glory to the Father, give glory to God. It's such a beautiful picture. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue to teach on the Word of God here. We are going to stand strong on these things. We're not going to yield to false teaching. We're not going to yield to people who try to twist the word of God. I'm going to stand strong in what I believe and what God's going to teach us. So let's stand together now for prayer.